I built the evolution of warfare in LEGO. From simple monkeys with sticks to trained killing machines. In this video, we're exploring huge medieval siege battles all the way to the nuclear bomb. And with every era, the casualties and war crimes get worse and worse. So hit the like button, subscribe, and stay tuned to the end for an insane giveaway. In the beginning, there was a bunch of primordial soup all consuming one another. Actually, you know what? Maybe we started a little too early on the timeline. Let's skip forward like a billion years. How about that? 2,000 years later. In the beginning, there was dinosaurs, predators, and prey. Long battles between the two. A mother trying to protect her small child while the predator tries to consume them both. What? But at the end of the day, they both got hit by a giant rock and died. Once the big lizards died out, it became the era of the monkey. Early primitive humans had a need for water sources. And sometimes rival monkeys would arrive to try and conquer the water sources. That's why it was so important when one monkey named Jeff, named Jeff discovered the very first tool. He of course used his tool to tool. beat the tool. other monkeys to death, tool. thus creating the first battle. But when all was said and done, these monkeys would soon become history. These early primates were all but forgotten. But what wasn't forgotten was the civilizations that came after them. Ancient men soon followed the monkeys. The Greeks, the Romans, Carthaginians, Celts, Gauls, the Persians, and many more other nations. These ancient men excelled in building wooden forts and palisades. Once constructed, hoplite spear and shield walls would form at the entrances to blockade them. Archers make cover fire from atop the palisades to provide fire for the soldiers beyond the wall. This was all done to keep the barbarian menace out of their lands. To the Greeks, the barbarians were any man or woman who did not speak the Greek tongue. To the Romans, it was simply any non-Roman. Eventually, these once mighty fortifications fell into disarray. Barbarians took over the once mighty kingdoms. I'll take that. It's mine now. From the ashes of the ancient world came a king. Then, all of a the sudden, there was another king. And another king. And then they just kept multiplying. You lot need to stop having babies. These kings were peaceful for the most part. But then one king's jester might call the other king's wife a walrus, and that might make him pretty mad. And thus, a jester starts a war. I'm the Joker, baby! And what do kings do during wars, you might ask? Well, one of them might build himself an army, and the other might build himself a castle. Now, during these siege battles, the kings had to look to the peasantry for their armies. Oftentimes, peasants had to bring their own gear or use used ill-fitting gear that the kingdom provides, often given crossbows since it was a simple point-and-click weapon, no mastery at all. A step behind those were the footmen, who might be regularly trained every few years in order to use combative skills. But there was a tier above all of them, too. Heavy knights, who were paid enough to have their own personalized equipment, horses, and squires, often coming in the form of cavalry. Oh, it's beautiful. Now obviously this would be quite an intimidating sight for a small castle. So the defending king would need to do some work. Archers atop high ramparts to fire down on enemy combatants as well as more soldiers above the gate holding barrels of boiling hot oil to pour down on unsuspecting soldiers below. The king would also ensure plenty of provisions were kept inside the keep in case the siege lasted for months, even for years. And of course, elite guardsmen would watch his every step in case of pesky assassination attempts. You see, killing the king would most likely lift the siege, as morale would plummet and that is the most important part of long-term sieges. The attacking army might bring in some siege engines, which might even include a battering ram, or shark launching catapults. That <laughs> did no damage. The catapults can also launch scouts' dog toys. Yay! Oh, now, now scouts like, 
<laughs> Ooh, siege warfare with my toys. With the walls breached, the Kingsguard prepare for the charge and their final stand. A deadly skirmish leaves multiple soldiers dead and wounded. But nevertheless, the defending king is slain and his head paraded through the streets. Meanwhile, while the kings fight, a small monastery off the shore of the ocean is about to be rocked. Vikings have arrived looking for treasure and gold. They end up ransacking the monastery ruthlessly, leaving no survivors. This ancient piracy would evolve past the Vikings and into the gunpowder era. The golden age of piracy has arrived, and these buccaneers are set Sadly stranded in their lifeboat after being blown up by a British galleon. That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. It's the 18th century and they need a beach to land on. Land ho lads, the pirates have struck the coast. They quickly disembark for they know that the British are on their tail. They're gonna go ahead and build a small fort, a firing base, to hold off the British with their muskets. The pirate captain has found the ruins of an old fort and decides to establish his defenses there. It's not much, but they can hide under cover with their new muskets and fire at the British. The pirates now have a beautiful garrison in the abandoned fort, all to protect their booty and their rum. Why is the rum always gone? But the British have arrived in order to parlay with the pirates. They come unarmed, a sign of trust. But they forget one thing, that pirates are not trustworthy. I started blasting. Bang. Seeing his fellow soldiers shot to death, George flees the scene. He's not about to get glocked himself. The pirates live to fight another day, and luckily for them, the British have bigger worries in this century. A ragtag army in the colonies has risen up against the British Empire. These boys revolutionized modern warfare, especially with the help of George. Washington. While the British would assemble in typical line battle formation with their muskets, Washington's men would take to the trees and fire when ready, waiting for opportune moments to use their ammunition, manpower, and positioning on the battlefield to wipe out the Redcoats, depleting British resources until the war became too costly and independence was gained. Now, there was a transition period between the muskets and the rifles, and one of the major wars that happened in that transition was the American Civil War. And it was bloody. It, extremely bloody. Uh, I mean, so many people died. But America came out on top against, well, against evil America. Now, the rest of the world saw all of these U.S. wars and got really, really jealous. So they started a world war and didn't invite the U.S. until many years later. Fulfilling every child's yearning for the mines, they began to dig, and dig, and dig. Once the children were done digging their trenches, they were given guns. Lots and lots of guns. In fact, the Industrial Revolution had ramped up so much that the weapons industry was popping off. This war was about to have billions and billions of bullets firing out of billions of guns that had just been produced. So millions of young men marched off to war to go line their newly formed trench systems, which helped them avoid getting shot by the myriad of bullets that these factories were producing and sending their way. Thus, trench warfare had begun, and we truly began to move into modern era warfare. Now, a hallmark of this new style of warfare was going to be the artillery cannons. Thousands of these were produced by both sides of the war, and artillery was the most devastating, casualty-inflicting weapon of the entire conflict. In the past, artillery used to look a little something like this. Teams of soldiers would spend time ramming their rods into these things and spending minutes to reload them. They had nowhere near the speed, explosive power, or accuracy of the howitzers of World War I, which could easily destroy an entire trench line and wipe out half of the company inside. But the Kaiser's men would still need to finish the job on foot. Thus, trench raiding became a highly coveted part of the military experience, 
with thousands and thousands of soldiers going up over the top in order to either raid or secure enemy positions. Entering no man's land was no easy business. You could easily get shot or bayoneted by enemy weaponry. But successful trench raiders were heavily rewarded with the best food or drink that money could buy. The only Lego food I could find was a carrot, so, uh, congrats. Soldier. World War I also saw the widespread use of barbed wire, entangling and killing millions of unlucky souls. Machine guns were also heavily researched and developed. Primitive tanks also made it to the end of the war. And of course, gaseous chemical weaponry was used. Now all of this made it so World War I got rave reviews and a blockbuster sequel was approved by the studio no more than 20 years later. Now World War II electric boogaloo hit Europe like a truck. Or should I say, a tank? Cause they used tanks during it. There were a plethora of combatants. Russia, Japan, New Zealand, China, Germany, Romania, Great Britain, France, the United States, Belgium, Australia, Canada, Finland, and so many more combatants fought in World War II. But not only that, the weapons used were so much more advanced than even World War I. Tank development had resulted in an arms race spearheaded by the Germans, having armor, penetration capabilities, speed, maneuverability, and so much more factoring into the war cause. This was a mobile war. Nice. But of course, the tanks needed a counter. That's where anti-tank guns came into play. Each nation had their own variant of the anti-tank gun. High armor penetration easily operated by a small crew of troopers. Then they decided to stick them on wheels. Tank destroyers were mobile, light armor, but with huge guns on the front that could penetrate armor easily. I like to call these bad boys the snipers of World War II vehicles. Engineering also took major strides forward. Tank traps, concrete bunkers, Portable Willys Jeeps, amphibious troop carriers, and so much more was developed during World War II, revolutionizing warfare to its fullest. Of course, the Third Reich ends up getting defeated and the Allies end up winning World War II. But uh, not all of the Allies end up staying BFFs, and so they build a giant wall keeping East and West Berlin separated so that they don't have to talk to each other. And this not talking to each other results in proxy wars. The United States soldiers ended up finding themselves in Vietnam, where the trees started speaking Vietnamese, and then suddenly your entire squadron was dead. The Russians found themselves in an equally bloody and long conflict in Afghanistan. In these proxy wars, we start to see actual modern weapons being utilized, but no main conflict between two large combatants. This brings us to modern day. What's that? In this old Iraq house, there's a hostage crisis? Help me, please, the hostage says. So, we pull up in the Giga Blicky with the World Police hit squad not far behind. We've got German operators, British operators, American operators, Australian operators, Swedish operators. Heck, even the dude from Call of Duty made it. That's because this lady lives in the US, vacations in Sweden, has a second home in the UK, speaks fluent German, has an aunt in Australia, and plays Call of Duty on the weekends. So the World Task Force arrives, perhaps a little bit overkill, and in a single sniper shot, completely domes the dude and saves the day. Another day, another victory for the OG. Taking down the sweats, the impostors among us. Modern conflicts are done in smaller tactical scale operations, often with joint task force from multiple different nations involved. But what might the future hold? Clout chasing zombies, bioweapons beyond human comprehension, killer ninjas from other dimensions, the inability to talk to women, or a bunch of sussy little fellas. You sussy baka. I hope you enjoyed every era of military history. We've got a bit of a giveaway for you guys here. We're giving away a World War I French soldier, a modern day soldier right there, a World War II German, and a few different medieval knights, just to get a little hodgepodge of every different era in here. All you gotta do to enter and to win is hit the like button, subscribe with notifications turned on, and comment down below your most interesting era of military history. Quick thank you to all of my channel members. I really appreciate y'all past and present, especially to the newest channel members, Elmira Studio, Lord, and Jopo Potter 
Butler. Y'all have been added to the Assault on Hoth, and thank you to everyone who rejoined and has been a member in the past. Just click the join button next to the subscribe button if you want to help support these videos. I'll see y'all in the next one. Peace. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Be sure to click that subscribe button for more content and hit the notification bell if you'd like to be alerted to whenever I live stream or upload. Thanks so much.